everyone. Thanks for joining us. Everyone, welcome. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to the first day of our 2021 Landscape Faculty Academy webinar series and the teaching techniques panel. Before we go into our housekeeping notes and get started, we do have some words from our premier sponsor, Rainbird. Please welcome Michael Roberts to say a few words to you guys. Well, good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to start the IA's Landscape Faculty event this morning and welcome you all. I'm Michael Roberts. I'm based here in Tucson, Arizona, been with Rainbird for a while. I'm a VP of Technology and Innovation. And over my time, I've run several of our business units at Rainbird, but through my involvement, uh, first with the Irrigation Foundation, and more recently the IA Board, I've had the opportunity to be involved in several of these events over the last few years. Rainbird is really pleased to be one of the sponsors again this year. We're delighted to see your interest and commitment to attend and gather information and educational material, which we hope you'll share with your students, the future of our industry. The need for highly educated top tier professionals in our industry has never been higher. I don't need to tell any of you, the last year has added challenges. On the one hand, the supply chain is under great stress, just getting basic raw materials in our industry like polyethylene, polypropylene has become very difficult and required unusual creativity and technical talent to sustain business. On the other hand, the value of landscape in our society has become even clearer. I just read a May 2021 report from Deloitte UK pointing out how during the pandemic, millions of people turned to nature to help them get through lockdowns and how access to green space helps avoid billions in medical costs and suffering through improved physical and mental health. So our industry has great value to offer the world and it's great that you're all here to further improve it. I wish you a fantastic day and I hope that you find the event extremely productive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for that Michael. introduction. And again, thank you for uh, sponsoring this great event. And uh, we certainly appreciate your support. Absolutely. With that, I will go into some housekeeping notes before we get started, and then we'll launch into the panel. Um, quick housekeeping, we have muted everyone by default, so we won't be disrupted by latecomers or any background noise. Please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation unless you have a question for our panelists, as this will help minimize any background noise. During the presentation, if you have questions for our panelists, you can ask verbally, raise your hand and we can call on you or via the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat box throughout the entire presentation, so uh, those questions will be voiced to our panelists as well. Feel free to put your video on for this session. We would like this to be an open discussion and interactive as possible. So if you are uh, wanting to put your video on, feel free. And lastly, we are recording these webinars. So if you do ask a question verbally, please know that uh, you will be recorded as well as it records those that are speaking. Um, but with that, I would like to welcome our panelists, Franklin Gowdy from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Craig Borland with the Toro Company and Tony Monzon with the Bilingual Training Institute. Uh, before we launch into some of the panel questions, I uh, just wanted to offer our panelists uh, some time to introduce themselves and give a little bit on their background. Uh, as a reminder, during this panel, if you have any questions, um, ask verbally or via the chat. We want this to be an open discussion and you know, a resource for you guys to ask our panelists any questions you might have. So, Feel free to jump in with any questions you might have. Before we jump into the questions we have prepared, uh, Tony, would you like to go first and share some background uh, on yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Tony Monzon, and I have been teaching, training, and landscape professionals in irrigation in both English and Spanish for nearly 30 years. And my background, um, is uh, I got a master's degree in soils and irrigation and I completely fell in love with that information. And then I started to work for the landscape industry and so the need for the training of the employees. So that's what I have been doing all these years. Great, thank you. Franklin, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. My name is Franklin Gotti. I uh, teach at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, California. I've uh, been here for, well, I got my degree from here as well. So I've been here since uh, the late nineties, but um, I've been teaching uh, landscape irrigation classes for about 10 years now at, at Cal Poly, uh, primarily to landscape architects and um, 
you know, uh, anybody actually that's interested, it's an elective course. Um, I actually served on the certification board for the Irrigation Association where I helped write exam questions and stuff for them. And I'm no longer in that role, but, um, and I think I'm going to be teaching uh, actually ag classes for the IA at the show. So um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's been kind of a nice relationship that I've had with the IA and, and I look forward to trying to answer some questions that you guys have today. Thank you, Franklin. Last but not least, we have Craig. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to some of you folks. I welcome you to the Faculty Academy. This is a great opportunity for us to share with you guys what we've been doing. I've been with the Toro Company for 28 years now. And prior to that, I've been a distributor, wholesale supply house for irrigation equipment. I was a licensed contractor for many years. I've been involved in the industry since 1978. So I'm somewhat new to all this tech and stuff. And um, over the years, I'm gonna say 40 plus years, I've been teaching technical classes to people that want to come to sit in a room and learn because their boss told them they have to be there. So my challenge is that they, for the most part, don't necessarily want to be there, but I have to make it exciting, real, and fun for them to be there. So that's part of the reason why I enjoy this so much. I, I, teaching is probably more of a hobby. I've been involved with the Irrigation Association as a as, as senior instructor for, golly, 20 years now. I've been involved with the faculty, helping write classes. I've helped the IA write several technical classes. Being a guy that's technically minded, it came from my father who was an electrical engineer and he wanted me to be an electrical engineer. And of course, I told him, dad, I'm going to deal with plants. It broke his heart and that was it. So with all the background he taught me, technical just seemed to be my forte and getting involved in the industry, controllers, valves, how they work, why they work, has just been so much of a passion of mine to understand and then to share. So enjoy the industry. I enjoy doing all the fun and technical stuff with it. And I got to say that my favorite part is troubleshooting because no two problems are exactly the same, but the method you use to solve the problem pretty much is the same. And that's what makes it so fun. And the best part is solving the riddle. So welcome. I look forward to sharing what I know and what I've learned over the years with you folks. And as I said already, please do not be shy, share, ask questions. This is your opportunity to ask us what you want to learn from us as well as us share with you. So Nicole, back to you. Great, thank you guys. So I will uh, you know, launch into some questions. And as you guys think of questions for our panelists, please jump in and, and feel free. We are here to answer any questions you guys have about teaching techniques and uh, ways to engage students. You know, Anything that you have for our panelists, we'll be happy to answer. So my first question for our panelists, what are your go-to strategies for getting students to participate in your class? Do you want to go in any specific order? Or you just want us to jump in or? Yep, just jump in uh, when, when comfortable. All right, I, I guess I can start. Um, you know, I, I've been teaching since 2008 and I got thrown into it at Cal Poly. They were like, hey, we think you have the personality to teach. You want to teach? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, I, I can't do this. You know, I'm, I'm, I barely know the content, you know. And so I was a little nervous that I didn't know, you know, what I needed to know to, to be able to teach. And, and so um, I kind of modeled my teaching after a couple of teachers that I, that I really enjoyed uh, while I was in school. And, um, and then I did a doctorate degree in education. And in the process of doing my doctorate degree in education, I learned what technique that I use. Um, you know, I didn't know that I had a technique until I started studying it. And uh, the technique that I use to engage students is what they refer to as funnel questioning. And, uh, and basically, it's just a series of questions. I teach with questions. And I didn't realize I was doing it until, um, you know, I started learning about how to teach and how to learn. And, and um, 
And so funnel questioning is my, my strategy. And um, it may not work for everybody because, you know, I think in questions, I guess, when I'm teaching. And so I'm constantly just asking them. And the, the reason why it's considered funnel questioning is because you start with kind of these bigger concepts and you just keep asking questions until you kind of get them down to the, the main key point that you're after. And so, uh, you know, that's, and so I kind of force engagement by just standing there after I ask a question and, uh, and just wait for somebody to give an answer, right? And, and sometimes you'll get two or three students that are doing most of the answering, you know, but, but what you'll see is the gears are turning, right? And the ones that aren't answering, the gears are still turning. And so, uh, you know, in the end, engagement happens whether they're physically engaged or not, meaning using their mouth to talk, they're mentally engaged because you're giving them, you know, questions that, that they, they know they should probably know the answers to, because they're not overly complicated questions, right? It's just like, Hey, what's the flow rate of your shower head? You know, and that's how I just start the discussion on what flow rate is, you know, and, and, uh, and then what units you need and that kind of stuff. And just by asking them some simple questions like that, you know, they're like, Oh man, I should know what the flow rate of my shower is, but I, I really have no idea. You know? And somebody will shout out, you know, 50 gallons a minute or something. And you're like, well, that's, you know, that's a little much. And so any case, funnel questioning is the technique that I use to, to engage students. Okay. So I'll follow you, frankly. Um, I have never had a technique uh, or a teaching method. And, uh, but recently I started to think about how I teach and um, I realized that I develop a system that I don't know if I can be elevated to a teaching method, but it's a system that works for me. And the main idea to engage people is that when I teach, and it doesn't matter the subject, two-wire system, water management, um, hydraulics, drip design, it doesn't matter. I become a storyteller and I am telling a story that needs to be compelling needs to be engaging and above all it needs to be effective in improving the technical knowledge of the attendees and that is the big goal is the challenge and it's easier said than that than done to me and um, i realized that i i try to achieve that goal through three pillars very clear the first one is to know in depth the information i'm going to teach and that, that means that i need to be learning all the time, not only to be current with the new information, but to challenge myself as to how in depth I know this information. That's number one. Number two is to develop a storyline. We need to engage and uh, connect all the information that we're going, we're going to teach in a way that is coherent and cohesive. So the people don't get lost, they can follow you. So by the time you're talking, let's say about friction loss charts, where all that information is in there, I should have already explained clearly the relationship that exists between flow, velocity, and friction loss. So when we get there, they don't get lost and they see how beautifully everything connects and influence each other. So that's the point when it comes to storyline. And the third pillar to me is to rehearse until my hair turns green. And you might say, Tony, that will make your presentation so stiff and it's the opposite. When you rehearse, you realize what doesn't flow well, where you have trouble to explain a topic, where you need an exercise. And when that is done and it becomes second nature, then it flows. And you don't need to worry about that. You can come across and be spontaneous. And that, to me, I put a lot of emphasis on that way to be spontaneous with people because I need to make a connection. And that is what allows me to make the connection for two reasons. Uh, first of all, because I, I don't think I can teach effectively anything unless I connect with my audience. And also, if I want my attendees to get out of the comfort level, give me everything they got and get to a uh, challenging, complicated, uh, difficult subject, if we have that connection, I see them really making the greatest effort. So that to me is essential. And when it comes to um, uh, online training, I learned recently that as you see me, I teach standing up. I want to reproduce as close as possible 
and in-person presentation and camera and mic is on at all time, no use of chat. So it is a flowing of information that comes and go and I that has worked very nicely, I think. Thanks, Tony. The best I can say would be, I kind of use a combination of both of those comments that were made from uh, Franklin as well as Tony Adet. I try to make it real. I take the subject matter that we're working on and I try to apply it to how I've used it in the past. I look at the faces of the students as I am now here for those of you that have the video on. I'm looking at foreheads, I'm looking at eyes, I'm looking at their intention span. And if you see them drifting, I try to focus my conversation a little bit more towards them to get their attention back in, but I want to engage them. So when I'm working on subject matters, I guess I apply what I've done over the years. I've made many mistakes over the years, and I share some of those lovely mistakes, not necessarily first person, but I knew a guy who once had a, and I used an example that ended very poorly. I try to bring it real and I throw just a small bit of humor in there because as embarrassing as I've made myself over the years from making mistakes and, oh, come on, what were you thinking, you knucklehead? I try to share those to people say, it's real, it happens. Even I can make these mistakes and it helps make it more, I guess, real to them as they try to understand what it is we're conveying. So it's, kind of a question. I ask questions to see how they are listening. I try not to get a yes or no question. I look for a question that drives a little bit more information out of them than a yes answer or a no answer because those questions, people realize, oh, I'm supposed to say yes to this. So they'll throw the yes in. And instead, I'd rather ask more driving questions about the subject matter as I go through it. So it's one, I try to engage them. Two, I want to pay close attention to what their body language is as I'm teaching. So the struggle between real and virtual classes has been difficult for me because a lot of these Zoom meetings, you really, it's hard to see their faces, see what they're paying attention to. And in a lot of cases, all I get is a name so that I really don't know what they're thinking or what they're doing, if they're reading email and why they're listening to us. But I try to engage as best I can. So Part of what Franklin said, the questions, part of what Tony said, make it real by storytelling. In some case, I use real life stories, real life mistakes that I've heard, I've encountered, or I've done myself to make it somewhat real to them. So that's the best way I can answer that one for you, Nicole. Great feedback, you guys. Thank you. Picking, piggybacking a little bit more on these teaching techniques, um, you know, I know we touched on ways to engage the students in the class, but do you have any other you know, tips or tricks or teaching techniques in regards to helping um, you know, delivery and retention in your students? Do you have any, um, any other techniques or tips on that aspect of teaching? Nicole, I think Carrie might have a question. She got she her hand up. Send it to you directly. Is there a question? <laughs> I am only seeing. I don't, no, I guess not. Oh, Sorry. Okay. So any, oh, go ahead, Franklin, sorry, you're about to start. Yeah, I guess I'll go again. Um, you know, one of the things I actually, luckily, luckily I'd learned this uh, pre-pandemic and, and it came out uh, that it was very much worth my time uh, for during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, one of the classes I teach here at Cal Poly has a hundred students in every single quarter. We're on the quarter system. And, uh, and so I, I would give a, a problem set, right? And I would say, okay, take this problem set and fill it out on a Scantron because the Scantron, you know, it was multiple choice. It was a lot easier to grade Scantrons with a hundred of them than to manually grade them all. And what I was finding was, is that everybody was doing really well on the problem sets. And then whenever I would give an exam, um, you know, three or four people would do well on the exam and everybody else would bomb the exam. And it didn't take me long to realize that, uh, that every student was just copying somebody else's Scantron. Somebody would do the problem set and then they would share the answers, you know, and they would just bubble in the Scantron, submit it. And so they were getting decent grades on the on the problem sets. But when it came time to do an individual exam, they had no idea what they were doing. And so I was I was how am I going to 
it fixes problem, right? How am I going to make the students engage outside of the classroom doing these problem sets on their own? And um, Cal Poly at the time had this uh, pro uh, program or platform called Moodle. We, we rebranded it as what we call PolyLearn, but Moodle is just a, a pl platform like Canvas or uh, Blackboard. I'm not sure which, uh, which platform you guys are using. But um, I, I decided to embrace it. And I spent uh, a solid quarter where all I was doing was putting all of my questions into uh, the question bank in Moodle. And I was randomizing them and I was making a uh, hundred variations of every single question. And then whenever a student would start a problem set, they would get a similar problem, but with different numbers, or they would get a similar concept, but a different way of asking the question. And so I literally ended up with, you know, over the course of the quarter, thousand, thousand plus questions in a question bank. And of course, each problem set had, you know, I have 10 problem sets over the course of the quarter. So they would end up with a hundred questions or something in each of those question banks. And I would only ask 20, right? And so it randomly generate 20. I had a program to make sure that it was fair. Of course, not that they got 20 of the hardest questions or something, but, um, and then they all individually had to log into their portal. They all had to individually do it and they could help each other, but there was no just copying the answers anymore. And as soon as I saw I did that, I saw the uh, scores on the exams uh, go way up, right? Of course, you still have students, that, but I can almost pinpoint them now. They're not doing well in the problem set. They're not going to do well in the exam, right? Why? Because they're just picking answers or something. So, um, so if you have a um, a management learning system, an LMS of some kind, um, you know, even here at Cal Poly, I would say that uh, half of our teachers, all they use it for is to post a file. Here's the PowerPoint. Right. And I mean, that's pretty useless. You can email the PowerPoint or whatever. Right. So um, utilize it as much as you can. Those LMSs, because uh, that will allow you to uh, to give. And, and I also allow the students to do the problem set more than once, knowing that when they they start the second attempt, they're going to get different questions again. And so it allows them to reinforce some of the concepts they've got. And if they're missing a concept, maybe they get a question a little bit different than before that they can maybe wrap their head around. And then I just take the average of those scores. So um, that's one of the ways that I kind of get the, uh, you know, the students to interact um, outside of the classroom with me too, is by using the, uh, the platform. Now, Cal Poly did transition to Canvas and uh, I, I hate Canvas so much, but um, it just, it does not have nearly the abilities that, uh, that Moodle had. So those of you that are working with Canvas, uh, you know, I'm sorry, good luck, you know, and uh, and I'm happy to try to share some of the tricks I've figured out about Canvas if you're interested at the end or something. But um, but yeah, I, I, I really wish we wouldn't have switched to Canvas, but that's, that's my personal opinion. It's Frank. Okay. Go ahead. I'll go next. Uh, what I was going to say is that either online, which is a new experience for me, like for many of you, or in person, I rely on what I just said, but also um, three things. And that is related to how differently people learn. So in my class, I am teaching and talking and asking questions constantly. And, but at the same time, I have a PowerPoint that is not for me to read or even for them to read. The text is very limited, but is the images, the field pictures, the, the, the um, diagrams that I might come up with to help convey the idea that I am discussing with them. So they have, he, they have their hearing, listening to me, they have the PowerPoint and then the exercises. And I find that either online or uh, in person essential, not at one point or another, but all throughout the presentation. So we are doing exercises that are traditional, like if we're doing an irrigation scheduling calculation or uh, we're doing a drip design, we are doing exercises uh, the traditional way, but also there are hands-on. So if I'm talking about valve troubleshooting, uh, even online, they have the valve, they work within the field, and I am discussing them. So it's a mixture, in my opinion, of 
uh, a lively presentation because especially online, we all know how difficult it is to stare at that screen, but primarily that the explanation, the PowerPoint heavy on images, very little text, and then exercises and hands-on um, activities. The whole thing, including all those questions that everybody's mentioning, it really brings the presentation to, um, I would say, more um, interaction. And you know what? I joke a lot. So if I see somebody falling asleep, I ask them many times, do you bring the cup of ice? And they say, what for? So you throw it through your back because half of you are sleeping and leaving me here by myself. So it is, I, I'm not pointing out anybody. I'm not you know, embarrassing anybody, but they know who they are. And then you stop there, you cannot recap everyone, and then you move forward. So here it goes. Well, I, I got to say, it's kind of exciting to hear that, that the classes that I've done, the IA classes, the classes I learned when I went, I'm a graduate from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo as well. And what they taught me is hands-on. The more hands-on that you have in the classroom, the more interaction that you have with them seeing you talk about it, they apply it to the thing they have in front of them. And uh, like Tony said, I can somewhat play with them. Oh, careful, don't touch that screw because that one is live. And they all, whoa, wait a minute. It's only 24 volts. It won't hurt you. Relax. It's going to be okay. But interacting with the students, watching the students apply what you're saying there to your another point, the PowerPoint, I try to avoid as much as possible too much writing in it. I use the PowerPoint as kind of like a cheat sheet for me or bullet points for me to remember what it is I'm going to discuss with them as much as it is visual for them to see photos of what I've seen in the past, poor wire connections, corroded wire connections, valves installed backwards, um, backflow preventers installed backwards, uh, people hooking up irrigation systems to a garden hose, not just the hose bib. So all these fun things that I can add into the presentation to not make it a video jam session, but to aid in the conversation that I am having with them, to use it as not a crutch, not for them to stare at and read, but for one, to help remind me what it is I need to discuss, two, to go over and show them what I'm doing so that they can apply it to themselves. Now, with the advent of this virtual thing this past year has made that incredibly difficult. It's hard for them to actually have a sprinkler timer in front of them, a voltmeter, yes, solenoid valve, yes, and this is how we take it apart. Now, well, this is the bonnet, this is the diaphragm. Okay, show me what you have. So I try on the virtual ones to make certain they do have their cameras on so that I can see what it is they're doing. Because again, I'm a very visual person and I learned years ago about body language, how critical it is for our everyday average conversation. Are they paying attention? Are they getting it? Are they out in left field? And if they're out in left field, I need to go over what I just said again, not necessarily focus on them to embarrass them, but uh, obviously I've got a wrinkled forehead in the room I need to redo that again, but this time maybe explain it differently so that maybe the wrinkles become aha. Because I'm always looking for the aha moment in each of the students when they're going through it. I know all you guys are teachers, you understand what I mean by the aha moment. And there is nothing better than to be struggling with some conversation with somebody and then their forehead just slowly changes to, I'm getting this now. So yeah, it's a go by questions, try not to embarrass, but watch and look for physical. And I'm not afraid to have one guy that really gets it. Okay, Trevor, explain to me exactly what you see in this and can you share it with the group? And a lot of times having one student share with the others helps engage them and gets the ones that aren't getting it to maybe see it from a different angle and help them out. So difficult with the virtual, trust me, very difficult, but I've tried as best I can to utilize those different techniques. Great. Thank you guys for that feedback. And I know, Tony, you just kind of touched on this, but one thing I wanted to uh, ask, and maybe Franklin and Craig have some additional feedback, uh, it's just that, you know, each person learns so differently, and you touched on this. How do you cater to different learning styles with your students? Go 
me start again? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> hey, Craig, just so you know, too, Cal Poly changed their motto, mo, uh, motto. It's no longer learn by doing. It's learn by redoing. Yeah, we, we mess things up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and, uh, and we have to retry. <laughs> yeah. That's very true, actually. You redo and redo stuff. again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I agree with Tony actually uh, quite a bit on um, on catering to different teaching styles. You know, uh, I find that I repeat myself actually quite a bit for the audio type learners. Um, I also do what Craig does where I have my PowerPoints of largely just photos, um, maybe a couple of keywords, uh, you know, to, to point out something in the photo. But, um, you know, so I'm hitting the visuals and then uh, the hands on piece is, uh, you know, that's obviously our motto learn by doing right. And that's kind of a big piece. Now. Virtually, that was very challenging for us, um, you know, in um, spring quarter of last year, you know, 2020 was uh, was kind of a challenge for me in particular, because I am um, one of those guys that really loves to be out in the field with the students. I don't really like to be in the classroom as much. And so I took the opportunity. Uh, luckily, I had a, another person here uh, that works with me and she helps with the labs. And we took a video camera outside and I taught the lab as if the students were there and it was just all recorded. So when they needed to read a pressure gauge, we just zoomed in the camera to the pressure gauge as if they were standing there reading the pressure gauge. When they needed to read the electric meter, you know, uh, for the pump or something, right? We just zoomed into the electric meter and they had to count in time how long, how many revolutions in time, you know? So we recorded it in first person as much as possible to get that hands-on, um, you know, approach. And, and I think, um, from feedback I got from students, you know, that they, they, uh, they were very, it, it was a lot of effort on my part. Right. <laughs> but, um, I was also looking to the future because in this time last year, or actually March of last year, I had no idea how long this was going to last. Right. We, I don't think we still know, but <laughs> in any case, you know, it's, uh, I was thinking, all right, I'm going to make this stuff so that it will be, you know, I can use it, uh, for, for future years even, or now I have this content too, by the way, that if a student was in my lab and didn't quite understand what had happened because maybe it happened too quickly for them, or, uh, you know, they had to go use the restroom and it would have, turns out to be a key moment in time or something. They can go back to these videos now. Cause I go ahead and I post them, even though we're back to in-person labs and they have access to this. And, um, it's, it seems to be a very positive feedback that I'm getting from the students. So I, re, I repeat myself a lot. I just did that again, right? That's one of the things I do. Um, and I use lots of visuals and then I try to make them as hands-on as possible. And I think that's how I hit. Maybe I'm not hitting a hundred percent, but I'm pretty sure I'm hitting, you know, 95 to 98% of the students with those approaches in my classes. So uh, that, that's my strategy in, in particular. I, I think in my case, I have the luxury of setting the maximum number of attendees. So for online, I realized 12 uh, because camera on, mic on, uh, I, I didn't think I could uh, provide results if I had a very large audience. So one of the things I realized is that everyone needed to receive a binder that includes the outline handouts and all the exercises. So they have that to be doing exercises as we're talking. But also I send a list of recommended equipment, irrigation equipment for each one of the irrigation classes in the program that I was teaching. And I know, uh, Craig, you mentioned controller programming. When we got to that point, I, I spoke with the manufacturer of the controller. They wanted me to train on and each one of the attendees had a controller. So the only one that didn't have a controller was me. They did. And the PowerPoint and the presentation was driving them function after function, trying to understand. And one thing I always tell them, you don't come here to learn how to push buttons. You know how to do that. So let's stop messing with the controller and try to understand each one of these functions, what it is that they are doing, um, horticulturally speaking, so you can get the best out of it. Uh, because I wouldn't think I could engage anybody, no matter how well they learn visually or the different ways people learn if they don't have the equipment 
in their hands and we can discuss it as they work with them, particularly online, as challenging as it is. All great stuff. I, I get the hands-on part. I can't stress that enough to be able to see them take a voltmeter, the red probe, the black probe. And I always throw the little joke in that my dad used to do to me as a kid. Son, red probe left hand, black probe right hand. Not like it makes a difference, but all of a sudden, if you say it that way, they go, oh, wait a minute, let me, and then touch that screw gently and be careful when you touch that one, you might get a little spark. And I watch them carefully and it's good to watch how they do it to make certain they're doing it correctly. When you take the valve apart, when you do these things, it's all about watching what they do. And that's the difficult part with virtual. I have yet to find a great way to see people take valves apart and understand what it is they're doing virtually. You can see some of it and you can try and help. All right, now be careful how you put that back together. The O-ring has to fit into the groove. If you push too much on this end, it'll pop out on the other side. So, you know, certain things you can watch and guide and help teach through. But again, it, 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 in-person training to me is still a lot better knowing our what Franklin said that we don't know how long this is gonna last. I hope it's not gonna come back around again, but virtual is a method we have to go with moving forward and trying to find ways to have them do it in their own setting virtually with you being able to watch and guide is, is the challenge, but that's the best thing I can share. Thank you guys. And kind of piggybacking on virtual learning and the pandemic, as you were teaching through the pandemic, were there any takeaways that helped you improve your teaching effectiveness that you, you will continue to implement moving forward, even you know, past virtual learning and once you we return to in person? Are there any you know, key takeaways that you've learned throughout this past year of things you'll implement moving forward? Yeah, that's, you know, there's things that I learned that I don't like, <laughs> you know, there's things that I, that I do like. Um, Craig was pointing out some of the things that, you know, you don't like so much with, uh, with virtual, but there are some things, you know, I, one of the things that I did early on was I, I bought a, a it doesn't really matter which brand, but I bought a Dell XPS 13 touchscreen and, um, and so I find that uh, when I would do a presentation in front of the classroom, right, you're, you got your laser pointer or, you know, you're, you're saying, see that thing up there in the corner, you know, and you're trying to get them to focus their attention. When I was doing it virtually on the laptop, right, they all have the screen right in front of them. So they're not sitting in the back of the classroom squinting, you know, trying to figure out what it is that you're talking about. And with the touch screen, and I, I have, a, I bought a, pin that goes with it, you know, a digital pin. I don't know, you guys are probably doing the same thing, but um, basically I just write right on the screen and I'm circling things on the PowerPoints. I'm putting arrows, you know, um, I'm doing things that I can't traditionally do in a classroom, right? You, you can write on the whiteboard, but you're not writing on the, the picture that you're projecting on the right board or, or the diagram, you know, um, when I was talking, when I teach about pump curves, for example, right, you can now basically just put a dot right on the pump curve, right where you're talking about. Whereas when it's just on a projector, you're trying to explain it, you know, and you're trying to point to it and, and so forth. And so some of those, uh, some of those things I'm trying to figure out, how do I implement that? Right. And so now I'm wondering, do I take my touchscreen to my traditional classroom? And instead of writing on the whiteboard for some things, I just write on the screen. So it's up on the screen, just as though it's right there uh, on their computer monitor, right? Those are the kinds of things that now I'm, because in fall, we're supposed to transition back to, uh, you know, in-person everything. So um, I'm trying to figure out what, what do I want to take, you know? And so that's a very valid question, Nicole, is what, what do we want to use moving forward, you know? And, and of course, what you use is, um, you know, up to you, obviously, but, that's one of the things. The one thing I think I'm going to miss, though, is I be just like Nicole's doing right now, you can record this. And so every lecture was via Zoom, and I recorded every lecture. I posted that lecture to YouTube, and then I posted it to my Canvas page. 
And so if they happen to miss a lecture that day because they had a hot date or whatever they had going on, right, then uh, they can come in and they can watch the video afterwards. And, and I think actually a couple students just said, you know what, I'm never going to go to class. Instead, I'm going to watch the video at two times speed, you know, and they're going to listen to me. And then I, I talk fast enough. I think most of the time that it's a four times speed or something, you know, but they just want to get through the content quicker and, and then they can rewind and they can watch a part again that they missed or whatever. And, and I'm thinking, how am I going to do that in an in-person class? Right. That, the answer is, I mean, unless you set up a camera or something, you're not going to be able to. So there are definitely some things I liked about being forced into virtual, but there are other things as again, Craig pointed out that, yeah, it just is not the same. And and the students here at Cal Poly, I think, because our motto is learn by doing, they really want to be in the classroom, a good majority of them, not everybody, but um, a good majority of them do want to be in the classroom. So, so how do you blend those two? I don't have that answer, unfortunately, but um, if you guys can come up with something, I'm happy to hear it. Uh, you know, I was thinking about that question and the only thing that came to my mind is go to the point. Just go to the point. And I think that has been the best lesson of online. We have a more limited attention span, rightly so, because the screen does something, I don't know how to describe it. So uh, with that idea that online, I needed to go to the point, I became hypercritical on how I explained things, what I did in class and what I showed. So I really, when I was, rehearsing for a presentation. Um, I didn't have my much pa patience for anything that didn't go really smooth. And uh, I revised all my exercises and make sure that they were structured in a way that they would flow smoothly as well and added more exercises because I think that conveys the idea a lot better. And with the, um, the PowerPoints I went through, that was the toughest part, each one of my PowerPoints and each one of the slides and decided to remove everything that wasn't absolutely necessary, that didn't affect the rigor of the presentation, out, 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 out. And that really freed me and freed the whole thing to go smoothly, to be streamlined and to the point. Because when I'm seated taking many, many tens of uh, webinars throughout last year, uh, I think we grow impatient. We have a lot to do. And that's my, my, my idea. These people that are attending my class have a lot of things to do. Therefore, I really need to make the best use of their time. And going to the point is the best one. Hard for a teacher that likes to repeat herself and all that stuff, but forced by the pandemic, that got done and I'm not going back. I'm not putting back those slides. I, I, I'll keep it the way it is. I would agree that, that it is difficult with this virtual stuff. I went out and got two additional cameras. So now that when I'm doing the virtual class, I have a camera focused on one item, another camera focused on another item, and I transition from them. I know people like to see the instructor, but a lot of the times in the virtual classes, I didn't have me on the screen. I had the presentation, and I also had the terminal board I was working with the valve I was working with, the voltmeter. I tried to interact it on the cameras, the different cameras and the different angles. I find that dealing with, and my, most of my teaching is with adults that are there because the job, the company says, all right, I need you to go to this seminar. I need you to go to this seminar. I need you to go to this IA class. And their desire to be there may or may not be very well known. So I have to try and make it real to them, but also convey it so that they can take and apply it immediately once they leave the session. Whether it's recorded or not, I think that that's kind of nice to be able to review back. And I like what you said, Franklin, to be able to post the video so people that may have missed something can come back and get it. Uh, try to utilize space. I try to slow down in my communication so that it gives them a chance to digest some of what I said. I've been to some training classes where I thought I was listening to Alvin and the Chipmunks. It was hyperspeed. And I'm like, wait, what? Hold it. I tell my son who talks at 90 miles an hour, hold it. 
what did you just say? And he says it louder, but the same speed. I go, hold on, slow down so I can grab each and every word in the sentence. And then I got to let this old mind of mine compute, digest, and regurgitate what I think you just said. So I try to make certain I keep it slow, provide time between sentences and subject matter to let it sink in. And I'm not afraid to just leave some dead air in there so that they can regroup from it all. That, that, that's my best understanding and realizing that, you know what, virtual training is gonna be a permanent way of our life to some level. And whether I like some of it, whether I dislike some of it isn't really relevant. I have to apply it to my everyday training techniques. And I'm sure all of you guys have found clever ways to make it work for your students. I, I welcome whatever you, input you guys can share with us on techniques that you've made virtual real as best as possible. Thank you guys for that feedback. We have a few questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is kind of a piggyback on uh, the camera system you mentioned or having multiple cameras. What camera system did you use to get multiple views, Craig? I found that Zoom, when you are the presenter in Zoom, you click on it and it allows you to hit each one of your cameras as you're presenting. What camera I got, I just got a USB camera. Um, one gives me macro picture so I can zoom right in and get extremely close. The other one is more of a wide angle camera. It, 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 I got them from a digital supply house, a B&H photo, I think is what it was called. But the cameras were fine. If you have enough USB ports in your computer to be able to plug them in, Zoom will allow you to switch from camera to camera in the Zoom presentation. I found that there's a couple other doing different trainings for different organizations. There's different platforms, but when you get in there, it allows you to toggle from one camera to the other. I hope that answers the question, but it wasn't really the cameras per se. It's that Zoom provides the ability to use different cameras. So does a few of the other presentations as well. Teams is another one that I've used a lot in it gives you the ability to toggle from one camera to another during the presentation. I know it's awkward and clumsy to move from one camera to the other, but I try to make light of it and go, all right, here's my feeble attempt to somewhat be an audio visual guy. Please bear with me. This isn't going to be fun, but at least we'll get to it and work with it. Make it real. Make it show that you are a human person when you're doing this. Great. Thanks, Craig. One other question we have from our audience. Nicole, oh, go ahead. Yep. Can, can I add to that just one sure. here? So Lindsay, uh, one of the things I did with my uh, labs, right? Because I, you know, I couldn't make. I had four different lab sections because uh, 100 students, you break them into lab sections. That's 25 in a lab section, and I wasn't going to do uh, live labs. There's just no way I was going to be able to do a live lab virtually. Right. And so I made all my labs asynchronous. Um, and so this is what I was talking about, where I went out there, I taught it like if they were standing there, we zoomed in the camera to where they would record, uh, you know, what nozzle size was in the pop up sprinkler, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the things that we figured out pretty quickly is, is that when you're doing a test that's timed, for example, right, they need to maybe see a timer because uh, time in real life and time on a video are different things, if that makes sense, right? Um, because you're cutting and pasting and you're clipping and all that stuff. And so we would actually have a timer set up and I would just set a camera and we were actually just using cell phones, both uh, Sarah, the person that was helping me and I both have uh, Android phones. We were just setting up the cameras and we were recording. And so we would record two or three different camera angles. And then we would use a software called Camtasia. There's multiple softwares that allow you to clip videos together and we would just sync the times right we would say okay here's here's the time when it started and then we would put multiple and you've probably seen this from some youtube channel that you've watched you know where where in the corner you have the timer ticking and you have what's going on in the rest of the screen and so they can see what time it's at while your test is happening you know and um and we did multiple camera angles same kind of thing in fact uh, on sprinkler overlap, you know, we would use essentially a drone and we were getting overhead footage of the, the catch can uniformity test while we're doing the catch can uniformity test. 
And so then we could flash back and forth between what it looks like from the sky versus what it looks like down on the ground. I could never do that in a lab section, right? Because they're all standing on the ground. They can't visually go up to the sky. And so I was able to bring in a couple cool angles with, with multiple cameras and show them what it visually looks like uh, from these other angles that I think was very helpful. And then you just got to sync them, of course, with using some software or something. So that's different than a hands-on one where Craig's trying to show a different camera angle of, you know, taking the sprinkler apart or whatever it is that he's doing. Right. But, but, um, but yeah, if you have the, the time to do video editing, you can make a lot of cool things for sure, for certain, especially with multiple camera views. Thanks, Franklin. Tony, do you have anything to add? Well, for the ones that don't have the setup with cameras, uh, one of the things, because my classes are an hour and 45 minutes, so time is quite tight. Um, I have to acknowledge I was afraid to start messing with that and taking a lot of my time. So what I did, and it might be an option to some of you, is that I, um, for example, for valve troubleshooting, I'm not doing it with a secondary camera, which be ideal, like Craig is doing. Uh, is doing it is that I take very close up pictures of every single step and I am projecting that on my PowerPoint. It's not as good as having a camera as you take things apart, but when time is of essence and online, uh, it worked really well. Even the people that didn't manage to bring the equipment uh, that they were a little bit discouraged. I said, I have it on the screen. So you will be able to see a step by a step, a close up picture and uh, that has been the way I have done without a secondary camera, which should come um, in the future, but for now, I don't have it. Thank you for the insight. We have another question from our attendees. Can you share your biggest fail during a presentation and what you learned from it? <laughs> yeah, um, I've had several. What's the biggest one? It's a hard one to put a finger on. Uh, trying to teach real to these people. I try to use my real life experiences and in the classroom as well when I'm, I was doing, and it, it's pretty simple, but we were doing voltage testing and I was working with the students, putting a voltmeter on the terminal strip in the right spot. And this one guy, real slow, I got to hand it to him. He was there, he was trying, but he just wasn't getting it so I walked over to him and I helped put his fingers there and I tried to just sort of put some humor and tried to give him a little scare as he did it well when I did it he startled and the girl behind him fell out of her chair because I not only scared him but when he scared he scared the person behind him and I go okay I guess I won't do that again I felt sorry for the girl on the floor I hope she wasn't hurt but uh, everything seemed to be fine it, it created a great opportunity for a 10 minute break. But yeah, I tried to work with people. I tried to use some slight humor in it, but I tried not to, yeah, my biggest fail was putting too much in it and thinking that that would be fun to have a, somebody do a little jump, but to get the girl behind him to fall out of the chair was a, an unintended consequence from it. Should I go next? Go ahead. Uh, I was, time for confession, I was frightened to teach online. And um, this is my first class and I have this company from the East Bay and they have a bunch of branches, everybody happy they don't need to drive to headquarter. And I start my presentation and things are going well and I'm so happy about it. And all of a sudden, poof, uh, Spectrum was doing some maintenance and not on purpose, they cut a line. So I was without internet and I stopped for a second and I thought this cannot be happening to me. It's the first class, what is going, what my client is going to think about what it is that I can offer. So I remember that I have left Pacific Bell, I mean AT&T, sorry, that's for long. So I switched immediately to AT&T and since then I decided to keep two. So I have two servers, they work beautifully. It never happened again, but I thought until I finish all my training programs, I'm not getting rid of either one of them and I'll keep two at the cost, but I, it was uh, a frightening moment. I, it took me 20 seconds to react. I switched, I went back to the class 
and that made the situation uh, not a drama as I thought I would have to face. So anyway, that was my big failure at the very beginning. I'm not, you know, I, I don't know. I'm a little bit careful, I guess, uh, with a lot of things. Um, in a classroom, I probably let loose a little bit more and like Craig, you know, tell a few jokes. And, uh, but when I know I'm being recorded, I tune that down <laughs> quite a bit, you know, because uh, you never know what they're going to use against you, you know. Um, and so um, I guess that maybe would be my failure is maybe I feel like I'm not doing uh, as good of a job um, online in terms of my, you, you, Craig was mentioning this too. And so is Tony, you know, it's really hard to read your crowd whenever your crowd is a bunch of boxes with names in them. Right. I mean, you know, you tell a joke and you're like, did, did that even go over? Like, you know, like, should I keep my day job? You know, like, how, do, how does that work? You know? And so I feel like maybe my failure is, um, is the fact that I just don't get the, uh, you know, the feedback, the feedback loop. And so uh, that affects me as a teacher, because I, I'm pretty sure Craig and Tony sounds the same way, you know, um, is we rely on the energy, right? Of It's kind of almost, this sounds maybe cliche or whatever, but it's almost like a performance, right? Uh, when you go to a performance uh, with Garth Brooks or whoever, and the crowd is just totally into it, man, he, he changes the way he, he, uh, he does the concert compared to whenever a crowd really isn't into it, right? And, um, and I feel that I kind of teach the same way that I, when, when I can tell that the, that the students are kind of into that particular lecture, you know, I'll intentionally sometimes go off on a, a rant that has nothing to do with the topic, but I know that it's pertinent to their, their future, you know? Um, it's maybe not irrigation related, but it is, you know, to the point somebody was talking about earlier is we have a hard time keeping students or getting students into these programs, right? And so once we get them in, we need to keep them in and you keep them in by, uh, by energizing them. Right. And, and then when you energize them it energizes you and it keeps going on. And I think I've maybe lost a little bit of my energy um, because of the online content or the online piece. Now, luckily my labs have gone back to in-person. And so I, I kind of get a little bit of the energy there too, but um <laughs> I'm in California, so we still are masked up and, you know, everything else. And so it, it's still not the same, right? Because you can't see a smirk. You can't see that. All right. Yeah. Dr. Gotti. Yeah. You're, you're kind of funny, you know, kind of thing because it's all behind a mask. And so that you just feel a little bit deflated sometimes when you're, when you're teaching these things. And, and so I guess that would be my failure is that I'm not feeding on the energy to, to keep my energy up. If, if that makes sense, you know, yeah, to dovetail on what you said, Frank, and it, it is true. And there are many times, whether I do it virtually or I do it in person, well, I look at the crowd and I go, hello, hello, is this thing on? Uh, hello, can I get a head bob of something? Is I, I draw the audience. All I'm looking at is a bunch of squares. And you're right. It, you don't know if they're listening or if they're wandering. And some might be going, what am I going to do today? What am I going to have for lunch? What am I going to have for dinner? They're off. The mind's elsewhere. So when I go, hello, hello? Are you guys there? Are you listening? I, I throw that out from time to time just to see if I can even get a single solitary smile. I know I'm that they're listening. So yeah, it, it's this virtual thing is poses challenges. I have to say those those weren't super bad failures. So good for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right, leading into our next question. As it relates to irrigation, are there any concepts or um, subjects that you think students have a hard time understanding? And I guess a, a two-part question, have you come up with ways to teach the subject matter more successfully because of this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, um, I would say uh, hydraulics. <laughs> hydraulics all day, every day. Um, yeah. you know, this concept, uh, Tony hit on it a little earlier, right? This concept of, uh, you know, what happens to pressure when there's more flow and all this, right? And you guys know it. So, but, um, but that is really hard to wrap uh, their head around, right? And how pipe sizes affects it and 
And then all of a sudden they think, uh, you know, friction is affected by elevation. And, you know, I mean, cause there's a lot of moving parts, right. In the, in the concepts of hydraulics. And so the, the strategy, believe it or not, the strategy that now granted, uh, I'm not sure what, uh, how old the students are that most of you are teaching. I, I know some of you are in junior colleges, so they're probably not 21 yet, but the strategy, I teach juniors. So most all of them have just turned 21 and they know what a bar is. Right. And so, uh, the strategy that I utilize is, uh, is uh, by relating it to drinking. <laughs> and uh, once I start relating it to something that they're familiar with, you know, uh, all of a sudden it makes sense. You know, so when I'm showing them a hydraulic grade line, right, I say, okay, if you're, if you don't go to the bar, you're static, right? And so the hydraulic grade line represents the amount of money you have in your account, right? And your account doesn't change. It's a nice flat line. And then, you know, if you go and you drink with a low flow rate, right? You're only having one beer an hour or something, right? Then you're just losing a little bit of money out of your bank account, which is like losing a little bit of energy, you know? And, and then the time basically represents the, uh, the length of the pipe, right? And then if you drink with a high flow rate, oh man, that's a steep hydraulic grade line, you know? And, and then I actually will throw in a, uh, uh, you know, uh, an Uber ride in there, you know, like a minor loss <laughs> and stuff like this, you know, I, I just, I kind of get creative and I, and I swear I can go through, uh, like Tony was saying, you know, trying to tell a story with how to get it all down and, and then go demonstrate it to them on a, on a, a thing we have with vertical pipes, you know, that are clear so they can see the physical energy in there. And I can just see they're all kind of still scratching their head, trying to figure out, man. And I just sit them down and I say, okay, let's, let's tell another story. And I tell the story about going to the bar and, and what happens to their bank account and, when you drink with a high flow rate and low flow rate and all this other stuff. And all of a sudden it's like lights just going off, you know? And it's like, I, I don't know why, when you talk about beer, all of a sudden uh, people get it, you know? So, uh, so yeah, that's one of the, the topics that I find students really struggle with is hydraulics. And, and that's one of the ways I've found, actually I use a boxed bottle of wine too, to represent a uh, uh, flow rate from a sprinkler, right? When the box of wine is full, the flow rate out of the box is higher. And when the when the wine level drops in the box, right, there's less pressure on the nozzle. And so the flow rate's lower, right? I mean, you they all know this because they've all used the two buck chuck stuff, right, filling it because I mean they're college students. So they they get it. And uh, so just uh, by by mixing a little bit of alcohol and uh, and hydraulics, man, it it comes together. So that's one of the strategies I use. Feel free to to use that however you want. If you want to try that, uh, probably not in high school though, I wouldn't think, but. <laughs> Those are great tricks. And I, I like your example. I, I struggle with getting them to understand water hammer and maybe I just grew up a weird family. Um, but having a younger sister and an older brother being in the middle, I was always the sandwich piece. I, I, my brother would give me things to do that were funny to do to, what are you doing kind of thing? So I shared them with my sister. Well, one day, good example, water hammer. We had a great amount of pressure at our house and the pipes were small and the kitchen sink had a single, a single throttle lever on it. And I'd bring this up in the classroom going, and my sister used to have this game that we called hang time. Meaning I'd take the sink faucet, put it on flow blast, and see who could get the pipes to make the most noise when you pull the lever down. As that lever would go down, the pipes would go boom, 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 boom. And I said that, uh, yeah, my sister and I would do this for a period of about five minutes or so to see who got the most noise. And eventually mom would come in, well, you two knocked it off. But what happened to me one day was I really got it going and I slammed the lever down so hard that the pipe under the house broke. And yours truly had to climb under the house to fix that nightmare in the mud and all that. So I shared to people that water hammer, yeah, it makes the noise. It can be somewhat entertaining. It's definitely not the best thing to have happen because bad things can occur. And I share with the pipe breaking. And then I pose the question to most of my audiences, either contractors who install it, architects and people like that. I said, why is it we always put the valves outside the master bedroom window? So at three in the morning when they come on, you wake up to this loud rumbling noise. Why don't we move the valves away from the master bedroom window? I just pose it as a question to the class to try and help engage them. And they all, it's funny how they all go, yeah, why do we put those things right outside the darn bedroom window? So it, it's kind of make it real, 
make it apply to them as best you can. And a lot of you guys are dealing with students that may not or may have done some of this in the past. So a lot of making it real for them is going to be, don't do this in the future because, and, and I'm looking to you guys for some of that input, how you kind of make it real to students that may not have ever done this before. Because most of my students are people that are out there doing it, they're struggling with it. And, oh yeah, I'm gonna go listen to this other knucklehead from somewhere, talk to me about this stuff. So I gotta turn it and make it, all right, you're here, let's have fun, let's learn something, or let's remember something we have forgotten in the past years ago. So the challenge I have is a little bit more different, but similar to what you all are doing on a daily basis. And that is how to make it real to the student, how to apply it so that they can not only understand what you're saying, but take it and use it next week, next year. I mean, we all have posed for the same challenge is that is to teach. This next step of it is not just to teach, but to have them know it and utilize it and make it stick. And that's the hardest part about teaching is make a subject matter stick. So it's not just there. I know, Franklin, you used a, I think you called it Moogle or something to that effect. So you can quiz them as they go to understand that they're getting it. I throw questions as I go along and I try to reach out and say, all right, Lindsay, did, how does this work? And I try to ask a student and I don't try to embarrass them, but just to get a concept, okay, I'm getting it reapply it. So I, and I pose this to all you folks in the audience here, you guys deal with this on a daily basis. How, how do you know that they got it? What's the trigger that you see that makes you go, yep, I made that work. Just like a lot of my classes, I get nothing. Crickets, <laughs> nothing but crickets. chime in. <laughs> Okay, I, I would like to say when it comes to the most challenging is irrigation scheduling. And every time there is a formula, any kind of calcula calculation, even if it is a simple multiplication and a division, it really poses a big challenge. And it doesn't matter if I'm teaching in Spanish or English. And it doesn't matter if it is an irrigation technician or even an irrigation manager or an account manager, it is challenging. And one of the things that I do to try to mediate that is that uh, irrigation scheduling, water management is not a series of formulas. What I like to do is to focus attention on the landscape environment and understand how each part of that environment, the type of soil, the root zone depth, the weather conditions, the type of plant, the type of irrigation system, how each one of those parts of the environment are going to influence the irrigation schedule. So you come up with something that is going to be conducive to maintaining that um, vigor in the plant material. So I think it's a lot easier as I have seen it, but still challenging when we're talking about the soil and understand what the soil is and how the combination of soil type and roots on depth are going to define a water storage for the plan and how ET help us measure how fast that storage is depleted. And when you need to replenish it, uh, where do you go? How far you let it deplete it? And all that needs to be understood with an environmental point of view, a horticulture point of view. Then the numbers come later and they help us expedite, expedite the process of scheduling. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge ever, irrigation scheduling. And the best way I have uh, to offset that challenge is to focus on understanding the soil environment and how truly each component of that environment are going to shape that schedule. Great, thanks, Tony. And I know we had a question in the chat um, regarding Water hammer, um, Lindsay asks, can you make a water hammer demonstration model? And I know Franklin, you shared your resource in the chat. I didn't know if um, either Craig or Tony or Franklin, if you wanted to add anything um, before we move on. That was just one, you know, since Lindsay asked specifically about water hammer demo, just to give you an idea, if you want to build your own, you know, uh, 
that's one we have here on campus that I utilize uh, a lot and you're, you're welcome to try to mimic it or somehow even on a smaller scale or something, right? To, so I show that the vacuum's created, you know, and that, that's always a question, right? What do you see there? And they always say air. And I'm like, no, actually you don't see air. You know, what do you see there? And, and uh, the answer is you see nothing, <laughs> right? But uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those, uh, one of those good little demos there. But um, so yeah, I've got, I, I've done videos on all kinds of different things, but uh, it's all unlisted, Lindsay. So I'm not sure if you subscribe to the channel, if that actually lets you see anything else or not, but, um, but they're, yeah, that's one video you're more than welcome to share in your classroom, or if you want to just kind of make your own uh, demo like that, have at it. Great, thank you. Another question I have for you all, do you have any resources that you can share that have helped your teaching over the years, whether that be um, resources online, associations, industry curriculum, are there, you know, any resources that you can share that have really helped, you know, what you teach your students over the year, over the years? Subscribed, and I, I hate to say it, but I guess I'm here, my foot's in the water, I better go in, that it, Facebook, they have forums, irrigation professional forums, irrigation, uh, wrongs, and different forms through Facebook and the photos that they have shared. I like those photos. And a lot of those photos are like the photos I challenge my students to share with me as well. I'd say, look, if you got one of those photos where you just look at and wonder, what was this guy thinking? And I share in the classroom a lot of times, one of my favorite lines is, guys, we're professionals here. We need to be the professional. We need to give the dumb a rest and start using our smarts for a bit in the class Okay, I understand we get paid to sniff glue, but that doesn't give us justification for hooking things up backwards or wiring everything like 20 wires into one single solitary yellow wire nut because it just doesn't work. But what were you thinking? A, a filter screen for a spray nozzle with wires in it and PVC glue? That's not a true wire connection, but I have seen it. I've got a photograph of it and I share it in the presentation. People all go, what is that? And I ask the question, what, 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 look closely at that thing. What is it? And I'll zoom in as best I can. And all of a sudden they go, that's a filter screen. Seriously, somebody did that? I said, more than somebody. I have now seen it many times. One of my favorite photographs is a bullet, a 22 long shell in the fuse holder of a sprinkler timer. And I've got the photograph and I, I show it to people and they go, what is that? I said, it's a bullet. It's a real bullet. It's live for crying out loud. And true to the story, I looked at the contractor where I'm standing in front of the clock. I go, do you mind if I take a picture of it? And the guy goes, no. I take the photograph of it. And he goes, do you like? I said, no, I don't like it because the Mythbuster said that thing can actually go off. Have you ever had one go off? And they say, no. I said, good. Darn it, but good. I mean, some of the things you look at getting pictures of it, getting it from the forums. I use them in the class because it helps them see, wow, <laughs> somebody really did that. And it is kind of tough, but it helps people understand that's what's wrong. We don't want to be this guy. We don't want to act like that. So getting stuff from the internet, getting pictures from other people to be willing to share the pictures. I've been out in the field a lot. I know you guys being instructors, don't necessarily have the same experience to go out, maybe in the classroom when you're watching people assemble things. And if somebody does it really backwards, try not to embarrass them, but say, okay, let's try and do this a little bit differently and guide them to the proper way of assembling it. And maybe getting a photo of what the end result looked like that was wrong so that you can utilize it for the next session that you're used teaching. I mean, real life examples, great opportunity inspire people to share photos that they've seen out in the field. Great opportunity to use them. So internet, I make it a, a great useful tool. Facebook, I know it's a social media nightmare and it can be very awkward to use in some cases, but the forums on there, great opportunity to use some of those photos of what bad things have occurred and to utilize it to show them, okay, we don't wanna be this guy. Do 
Tony or Franklin, you have anything to add? Go ahead, Franklin. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, actually, you know, I, uh, I, I'm at a little bit of an advantage, I think, because I, I came through the university system here with Dr. Burt, and Dr. Burt wrote a lot of the content that, uh, that is used, especially in agriculture, but it is, uh, he wrote a lot of stuff for landscape, too. And so um, I had resources available to me as I was, uh, you know, I took the classes that I teach now, too. So, I mean, it was kind of a, um, yeah, I was cheating. Let's put it that way. But, um, but what I did was, is I, uh, I created a lot of online content. Again, this was pre-pandemic because we kind of saw that maybe online is going to be a future thing. And, uh, and so I'll share it with you here in the chat. But, um, but it's all offered through the Irrigation Association. These are all um, uh, basically, um, they're, they're asynchronous, essentially virtual classes where we uh, were, we went through and we basically created the content uh, and it's all, uh, it's all animated PowerPoints and it does a really good job of explaining things. It comes with the lecture notes and everything. So um, we designed them primarily for people that were wanting to get certified uh, for the Irrigation Association or through the Irrigation Association or for people wanting to get continuing education units. But I have had uh, teachers, uh, for example, one from Victorville, I don't think he's on this call, but uh, he actually uses the content in his classes. He's using it as a, uh, you know, so he, he pays for the content and then he uses that content in his classes. So uh, there's some resources there that you can use. Uh, it comes with lecture notes. It comes with a, quite a few different things there that you could, uh, um, that you could potentially use if you wanted. And so it's got several topics. It's primarily about irrigation design and auditing, irrigation auditing. But um, that's something that you might, uh, you might consider using if you would like. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I wrote the scripts and everything that go along with it that it's not my voice because uh, I didn't want to be the voice way back when. But, um, but yeah, I think it's pretty good um, content if, you, if you're interested. Uh, Nicole might be able to work something out with you too, or something if you want all of it or whatnot. I'm not 100% sure, but um, but yeah, there, there's a potential resource. I, I don't, have you ever shared this stuff with them, Nicole, in the past? Or yeah, we share like our uh, teaching resources manual with folks. Um, that includes our you know our workbooks and and this kind of stuff as well. Yeah, so the IA is a Obviously, you guys are here as part of the IA. They're, they're a valuable resource. They got a lot of content, um, and they offer a lot of books. And a lot of the books they offer too are, are books that were written here at Cal Poly. So, so yeah, uh, utilize us uh, if if you want for helping you develop content in your classes, or or you can just use this content almost directly if you wanted. Right? I've got enough content here that you could probably turn that into an entire class there, or maybe even two. You know, if you if you already have quite a bit of background in it, especially, right? So, so there's one for you. Um, I, I, I was thinking about that. And um, certainly, I mean, in addition to all the studies that I did and uh, the, the classes I attended uh, throughout my master's program and the work I did in the field at that time, then you need to keep on going. You're thrown in the real world and you need to keep current and dig deep, deep in what you think you know constantly. So I can tell you that obviously in addition to the classes that you go to get the CEUs for the certification that you might have or just because you want to keep on learning from other professionals, I can point out three sources. Number one, universities. Uh, you can Google uh, uh, any information you're looking for, and there is always universities that have outstanding material and the extension service as well. And you can rely on the accuracy of that information. Uh, number two, manufacturers. Uh, many people don't know what they put together, but they put together amazing references. When it comes to troubleshooting guides, even design guides, they are really well done. 
And uh, again, I don't see many people knowing about it, but I rely on that. And with the troubleshooting and the design guides is their catalog, which has a lot of technical information and a lot of information that we need to use and is going to be very helpful to stay current. And the third source, in my opinion, is everything that industry associations have put together, primarily the IA. So all these booklets that have been put together, I have enjoyed tremendously. Their application to our industry, how thorough they are, and um, is, uh, I think, a combination of these things. And that's why I have this book here, because I don't deal with the students. I deal with landscape professionals. And I say, listen, um, you need to have your box. You need to have catalogs. You need to have design guides. You need to have references because it is almost as if when I ask a question and I say, what is wrong in this picture? And they all want to say something and I say, no, no, we are the only industry that need to give an answer right there. What do you need to do? Turn on the valve, observe, take measurements with your tools. Many times these tools are not in the toolbox of the irrigation professionals, and then consult your references, catalogs, et cetera, and then you can give an informed opinion. But I want to emphasize one thing and I'm done. We don't need to fight with learning and studying. It almost has become an offensive word and because it's the book smart and the feel smart. And I put 100% of the emphasis on the feel experience, but that by itself, will not uh, help you through your profession. There is no reason why we put as much emphasis in the field experience as we put on studying and learning and studying hard because there's a lot to learn in depth to make us a first line uh, irrigation professional. That's how I see it. I have a question for you, Nicole. At one point, and I'm not sure if the foundation still does this, we used to sell course content, abbreviated course content to uh, members of the group here, like these, all the students in the classroom today here, or the teachers in the classroom, do you guys still sell the content, the courses, abbreviated course material? We have, and, you know, sell like the workbooks uh, with like the instructor manual and the student handbooks, that kind of thing. We sell those, but, um, is that, is that what you mean by the, the course content or is, was there something different? In, year, in years past, there was, we put together like course material where an instructor would help build a class just for the academy, just for the, the to be make available to other instructors throughout the country at different universities and stuff. I don't know if we still have that, but that was another great resource above and beyond the books, above and beyond real life scenarios that I've encountered over the years. But it was something that the foundation put together is like, I hate to say the word hyper class or mini class or something that the school like Cal Poly could purchase this particular class so that teachers can apply it to their lectures. I don't know if you still have that or not. It used to be a pretty good library of things, but this goes back, I'm gonna say five, 10 years ago. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I will have to check in on that. Um, but, you know, I know we do sell the, the handbook and the student workbooks and that kind of thing, you know, and then we share, you know, like presentations as part of Faculty Academy will share the PDF. So they kind of have that as a resource. And sometimes at the in-person events, we'll share labs, but I'm not sure about that certain aspect, but I'll definitely look into that and see what we might have done in the past. And I know one of the one of the biggest challenges with the workbooks was that they are only they're only hard copy, and the IA has been slowly trying to convert them into a digital format, which will be purchasable or sellable or viable, uh, which will be nice, uh, especially when we go more and more online with our classes. Um, it's very difficult for us to ship uh, books all over the country or all over the world to be able to kind of support those. So hopefully they'll. They're, because they're a great resource. And if we can get them in a digital format sooner than uh, later, will be a wonderful resource for us, I think. And should go gangbusters because I use them quite often in my classes. It just gets to be a bit of a copyright con concern when you start producing digital workbooks, then you don't really have control who takes it, copies it, and you know sends it out. And 
then we lose our revenue stream. But yeah. No, no, actually, but you can you can have them if you're set up for a class, you can actually have them purchase where they're just purchased and each student has to actually purchase each one of those um, individually. And so um, it's something that can be done. Um, otherwise, it's it's either that or no sales at all, because if, if we can't use those books, then there's no sale whatsoever versus that. And that's part of the risk that you would have to take. But most of the time, you can actually have those designed so that you, you actually have to have a particular per purchase and then and a code and everything else to be able to make that work. And I think that's something we're still working. I know we are getting close to 1.30 Eastern here. So I wanted to make sure there wasn't any additional audience questions. I know some folks have been writing in as we go along, but wanted to kind of open up before we wrap up uh, to see if there's any additional questions from you all. Again, you can write in the chat or unmute yourself in and ask as Brad has done here today. While you're thinking of your questions, I'd also add that um, uh, rely on your manufacturers. Um, you know, they they will they send. Uh, you know, Hunter has sent me catalogs for my classes, right? And so I can have a physical copy of uh, of their catalog. Rainbird sent me the design manual, physical copies. Toro sent me catalogs as well, right? So I mean, you can you can call these manufacturers and say, I need. Uh, 20 catalogs and they'll send you a hundred of them because they can't get rid of them or something. I don't know why, but, <laughs> but yeah, you know, um, uh, yeah, if you want a physical copy of something, you know, um, not just for you, as Tony was mentioning, you can get them for your entire class and they're more than happy to, to get those in students' hands. It, it sure seems, you know, and Craig, you can probably speak to that or, or Warren. Oh, absolutely. Know. All of our, all of our product is digital, so you can download it and have it for, cut and pasting into your classrooms and stuff like that. So yeah, Toro has a lot of digital media on their website. And we have a lot of YouTube videos that you're welcome to utilize for any of your classrooms to add in, augment pieces of what you're trying to explain for your classroom. So we do have that. And I appreciate what you shared, Bradley, that it's either I don't sell any books or we sell them with a lock code on them or something. I do agree more digital format that we can get any of this information available. So you folks out there can utilize it in your classrooms because ultimately I rely on you guys to produce the next generation of contractors out there so that this circle we're in continues to roll. I mean, yeah, we're getting older and I don't see a lot of young blood coming in and what we do have, I try to help embrace and share what I've learned with them. And so, it's I'm leaning we're leaning on you guys to help produce us the next generation and so whatever we can make available to you is a benefit for all I agree uh, the manufacturers are an absolute god they've been an absolute godsend for me uh, being able to work with my online students and for the in-class students and without them I had just been it had just been a I don't know, not necessarily a disaster, but it wouldn't have the their the, the opportunities for the students would have been extremely minimal, especially uh, building at home packs to send the students to be able to do some at home projects at home um, without manufacturer assistance and help and just <laughs> their love and care would have just been very, very difficult. And so I am just super appreciative of all of them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Lamone just made a note there that uh, Hunter's done the same thing for me. You know, they shared a valve that's all clear, clear and cut away. So the students can, you can pass that thing around and they can see it. And um, so, yeah, all you have to do is ask, don't be scared to ask, you know, I mean, they nine times out of 10, they have one sitting on the shelf, you know, and they're, they're happy to just send it out to you. You, you ask, uh, you ask about getting 30 valves. They might, you know, say, well, I don't know about that, but, um, and maybe they will too, you know, but if, if you just need one or two demo valves or they're, they're usually more than accommodating and the more stuff you have like that in your classroom, you know, uh, I've got a whole wall of just, uh, parts like that, you know, some of it's antique type stuff, you know, to show where we came from. I've got an old Toro rotor head. That's like, you know, three feet in diameter or something sitting on a shelf over there. It's not really, but it's huge, you know, to kind of show what, where we used to be versus where we're at now, you know, um, so yeah, ask ask um, the manufacturers, uh, and and you'll probably get a few parts that you can demo for sure. 
I'm not trying to put the manufacturers on the spot here, but. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, great feedback, everyone. And I know we're right at 1.30 and I wanna be conscious of everyone's time. I didn't see any additional questions come in, but I did wanna give uh, our panelists a last chance if they had anything they wanted to add before wrapping up. Any last minute thoughts that you wanna share with our educators? I, I would say um, know the content that you're teaching because if you don't know it, they know it. <laughs> That's my, that's my go going away words right there. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. That was my first comment. Uh, but also, uh, I would say, don't be afraid to expose yourself a little bit because going to the importance I give to that connection that really helps me teaching and helps the attendees to really go the extra mile that they never thought they would go to. Uh, all come from that, uh, being able to just loosen up and, and give more of yourself in that scenario where um, there is uh, the spontaneous uh, presentation that really breaks the barriers and bring uh, that connection that is, in my opinion, so needed. And that's why online, I praise all of you that teach with camera off and mic off because I find it that you cut a lot of ties that are essential for um, helping us as instructors to do a good job. Yeah, I, I agree with both of you folks. And I, I will speak from a manufacturing standpoint at this moment, the one and only chance that, yes, we will provide a lot of product available to you folks out there who are putting these classes together. Terminal boards, valves, cutaways, that always are a little bit difficult to do because that way we have to go to our lab and have somebody cut them open and stuff. That's time. But I have a lot of scratch and dents that we're more than willing to send out into the field, terminal boards, things of that nature. They will help you with your classes. Don't be afraid to ask. I know I represent Toro here, but Rainbird has done it. I know putting classes together for the Irrigation Association, Rainbird has been very willing to send out product. Hunter has sent out product. K Rain has sent out product. All the major manufacturers are more than willing to share with you folks because we all recognize the fact that you're training our future customers. And that's what's so important to us to be able to get our product into their hands, into your hands. So, yes, we manufacturers will definitely do what we can to help you guys out. I'll leave it up to Nicole if you need to reach out to us. Uh, she's got a way to get a hold of us. So, I'll put that on your shoulders, Nicole. You're welcome. <laughs> Yes, I uh, have included their bios and, and contact information in the Dropbox links, link that I sent out this morning. But uh, with that, I want to um, thank everyone for joining in to our first session of the 2021 Landscape Faculty Academy virtual series. And uh, a big thank you for joining in on this teaching techniques panel. Also, thank you to Tony, Franklin, and Craig for being a part of this awesome panel and providing such great insight and information, tips, and tricks to our educators. It was awesome to hear each of your background and advice um, over the past hour and a half. So thank you. Our next session, which is the ATSM Bonders Certification course, will begin at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. As a reminder, that session has its own unique Zoom link. Again, thank you to Tony, Franklin, and Craig, and a big thank you to all of our sponsors, Rainbird, Hunter, Ewing, and Brightview. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.